Welcome to The Book Podcast, where we discuss books about the book, the Bible, with your hosts, Scott Moffitt, Gabriel Penfield, and Gary Karwaski. We go as deep as we can go, look as hard as we can look, but we only scratch the surface of the meaning of the book. We only scratch the surface of the meaning of the book. Hello to our listeners. This is our 17th podcast of the book. It's our privilege to be with you. And today we're joined by Dr. John Whitehead of the Rutherford Institute. As you know, we interview authors about important books, those who have made contributions to our understanding and application of the book. When I suggested that we host Dr. Whitehead about his books, A Government of Wolves, Battlefield America, and the Eric Blair Diaries, I was questioned. I got a little bit of pushback from Gary about how that fit with our purpose. (laughs) Well, it's not a leap to connect what's taking place in America, the assault on our freedoms and the expression of our religion as salt and light, to being repressed uh, as revealed in John's books. As believers, we find that the Antichrist culture is all around us. The country is on fire. It literally has been a difficulty in navigating these muddy waters when it comes to our civil liberties. These civil liberties are systematically being stripped away from us by an oppressive government, which is supposed to guarantee them to us. So it's my hope that you will have a better understanding of your rights as an American for having spent time with Dr. John C. Whitehead. Thank you for being here today, sir. Hey, thank you for having me on the show. A little background. I think you might find this helpful. John is an attorney, an author, and a scholar. He founded the Rutherford Institute in 1982, more on that in just a moment, which is located in Charlottesville, Virginia. That is the home of the University of Virginia, which is a stone's throw away from Thomas Jefferson's home, Monticello, or Monticello. I believe Jefferson was one of your early heroes. So I am your host, Scott Moffat. I am joined once again by Gary Karwaski and Gabe Penfield. A quick reminder, if you would please hit the subscribe button and the notification bell, that will help us and you won't miss another release of the book. John received his BA and his JD from the University of Arkansas and his School of Law. He is a veteran serving as an officer in the United States Army from 1969 to 1971. He is a Vietnam veteran. And as I mentioned, John is the president of the Rutherford Institute, a public interest law firm that protects the civil and religious and human rights of all Americans. He has authored 30 books, written countless articles on constitutional issues. He's debated on college campuses and practiced constitutional law, which makes him one of the nation's preeminent civil rights and civil liberties attorneys. He's filled... Excuse me. He's filed numerous amicus briefs before the U.S. Supreme Court and has co-authored several landmark Supreme Court cases and continues to champion the freedoms enshrined in our Bill of Rights. He's a frequent commentator on television and he writes a national weekly opinion column. Today we discuss his three latest works, the best-selling books, Battlefield America, A Government of Wolves, which here is one of them. The other one I read by Kindle, or the other two, so I don't have them to show. But uh, as a pastor, I also had the privilege of using John's award-winning series, Grasping for the Wind, which examines cultural events in the previous, I think, four centuries through, through the prism of art. So, John, you have lived a wonderful life, a busy life, and God has blessed you in your work. Let me ask, as I always do, why did you write these three particular books in the past couple of years, eight, ten years? Well, I've been writing, I've been writing books like this very since the 1980s, to be actual, uh, to be honest. Mm-hmm. Um, from what I'm seeing about the government and um, the what we're moving toward in this country and, and the world, by the way, we're moving toward a global state, by the way. If you don't mm-hmm. know that, it's time to get ready for that. But it's already moving in a direction. Google admits they work with uh, the Chinese government in uh, how they're dealing with their social credit scores. If you know anything about the Chinese government, and they lead people the way, by the way, to concentration camps, and, and Christians are involved in that. 
And what they've, uh, you know, you know, if you got the large corporations that are working with China, but they also work with the uh, federal government out of Washington D.C. And you, you gave me, you gave a little bit of my background history. I've been in, out of Washington D.C. for forty years. I was going to establish a law office there in the beginning, but I was in so many meetings and things I saw and talked to so many government officials who kept warning me, John, you're an honest man. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure you want to be in Washington D.C. In fact, I had a leading senator. <laughs> he took me out to breakfast, and he said, um, "I'm getting an echo here." Yeah, do you hear that echo, Gabe? Yeah, a little bit. Okay, there you go. I think it's wrong. But anyway, what happened was he said, "John, in the morning when you're walking through uh, Washington D.C. and someone says good morning, it's for money." And so uh, there was a, a really nice, well done study by Princeton University, Northwestern University, and Harvard on where money congregates in the United States. They came to the conclusion, the professors, it's a, it's a good study, it's on our website, by the way, at rutherford.org, where you can pick, read all of our stuff. And But they came to the conclusion that money congregates in Washington, D.C., that the government's run by an oligarchy elite, that's their quote, of 585 billionaires. You've heard the phrase, the deep state. Uh, the deep state is what the, the FBI, who leaked, the memo was leaked. We don't know who leaked it, but it got leaked. Uh, I think it was 2015, 2014, where they used the phrase the deep state, or they referred to it as the seventh floor group. Seven floors down under Washington, D.C., supposedly, there's a congregation of elite that run our government. And that, uh, again, we, if you study, and all I do is study this stuff. Um, if you've heard of Mount Weather outside of Washington, D.C., has anybody heard of that? Mount Weather, after, you know, when 9-11 happened, cars were lined up outside of D.C. going into this mount, mountain there called Mount Weather. Oh. Mm-hmm. Washington Post revealed that there's an underground facility there. It has a shopping mall. It has an office of the presidency. It has all these things that you would need, the armed guards. It goes way down on the ground. I don't know how many stories. Come to find out there's over 70, at least 70 some of these around the United States. Where the government, in case in times of distress, they use that phrase, uh, they can escape. But here's the question. If they're supposed to be representing us, why are they building underground facilities across the United States where they're going to hide out, we'll get bombed or whatever happens, they're going away. Do they really represent us? And the, po- the, the, the answer to that is pretty easy. No, they don't. Uh, they represent money. Money and they mm-hmm. want control. And that's what we're seeing. I've had a number of former NSA agents meet with me. They've read my books, too. And uh, I was surprised that (laughs) I had former intelligence officers coming by to see me saying, we read your book, man. It's worse than you think. (laughs) And uh, that's the kind of phrase they use. I'm sitting there going, Mm -hmm. it's worse than you think. And one of them actually said, I'm surprised you're still alive. And I said, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. well, you know. (laughs) I I, I, I I didn't get the bang bang yet either. But the point is, is that, um, that's who's ruling the government we see. You think that the, pre- the president doesn't run the government. It has over 300, 300 and some eight federal agencies. I mean, they don't run the government. But here's where I'm getting point I'm getting to with Google and all that stuff and Facebook, which is now meta. Mm-hmm. They're moving toward an AI universe. Okay? Everything's going to be controlled by artificial intelligence, robots, and they're already doing it. That's why I have some people wonder, well, I, I use this word, but what happened? Why did I get knocked off of Facebook or Instagram or whatever? The AI computers are already doing it. They've been running the show for a long time in many ways. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. Uh, Elon Musk, if you've heard of him, I'm sure you have, Mr. Nice. SpaceX and, uh, and all his other dealings. But he says, I'm trying to warn people. I'm trying to warn people. Uh, but they won't get it till they see the robots running down the street at it. And the robots are emerging. I just watched a video this morning of a new robot police dog that has a mm-hmm. machine gun on its back. Mm-hmm. It was shooting at targets. Pretty darn accurate. Uh, and that's that's where we're moving, folks. And uh, Musk mm-hmm. also said this. He says, we're going to be run by an AI dictator eventually. Here's the problem, though, he said. If it's a human dictator, it will die mm-hmm. sooner or later. But the AI dictator will not die. It will be extremely cruel, basically. Uh mm-hmm. And it's not going to make moral decisions based on Judeo-Christian principles or the morals that set this country up. 
And so that's where we're moving. And I'm trying to get people to wake up. Yes, why I wrote the books. I saw I saw these things happening, and I'm going, geez, I've got to get the information out there. Because my goal of my life has always been just to get people to think. Education precedes action. And here's the problem. Most people just sit and watch TV all the time. That's all they do. 150 hours of television a month, the average American watches. Mm -hmm. We are lost, ladies and gentlemen. When you see children today, young people, and Gabe will know this for sure, staring at their cell phones, it's like, here's my God. I worship Mm -hmm. this. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's... I mean, it's scary, but when you, the reason I'm getting to that point is is that when you have people like Mark Zuckerberg going in and out of Washington, D.C., meeting with the president and not saying why they were meeting and the things that they do together, I mean, it's it, we, we moved into a corporate state, much like the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire was a state run by money and power, and you saw what happened to it. You saw what they did to people they disagreed with. They stuck them on a cross, tortured them first, mm-hmm. they stuck them on a cross. Uh, I believe we're moving in that direction. It's going to be done in a different way. And with all the surveillance we're seeing, I don't know if you studied all this, but I can give you a few statistics that will hopefully sure. bring your listeners to life. But uh, we, live in a, we live in a total surveillance society. Mm-hmm. And uh, people don't know the National Security Agency, the guy that Snowden out and fled away from uh, overseas, uh, has its Five Eyes program. It has bases all over the world. It set up a global, basically, system mm-hmm. of surveillance. They work with 17 countries annually, 17 mm-hmm. countries, uh, and set, keeping this system operating. And, I mean, there's all the big com- companies countries are working with them. So people are saying, I can, well, I can escape America or escape here or there. No, you won't be able to escape. Mm-hmm. If you have any kind of electronic device on you anywhere, you may have... An electronic chip, and you don't know it. I mean, that's what mm-hmm. some people are saying now. They've moved already into the chips. We just don't know it. And some of the great thinkers of the past said, we moved into 1984. Look by George Orwell, uh, who predicted a lot of this. In 1934, people didn't realize it. Mm-hmm. This has been going on for a, a long time, if you go back into history and study it. And... Uh, I, uh, I'm, people are saying, well, what, what will save us? Well, number one, knowledge will save, will help save you. You've got to mm-hmm. read the books. You've got to study. You've got to get informed. Uh, and we've got to grab that culture we used to have where mm-hmm. communities came together. Today, I've, we're in a, what's uh, called the final phase of society. It's called disassociation phase, mm-hmm. where people just step back from one another. They don't trust each other anymore. They're dedicated to Heil Hitler, Heil Biden, Heil Trump, or whoever they are into at that particular point in time. And that's where their brain's at. The question mm-hmm. is, should we be going around doing that? Why would a rebel like a Jesus Christ get his head smacked? He wasn't doing any of that. He was just trying to help people and telling the government to get lost, you know, and mm-hmm. considered a bandit. And bango, dingo, he's put on a cross and, and executed. But that happened to many people in places like Jerusalem around the world. You're seeing that in China today. You're seeing it in places like Australia where they're taking people away. They're knocking on their door. And with what we're seeing today, and again, most people don't realize this, the, the media does not publicize what they don't want you to know. There are 80,000 SWAT teams that occur annually in this country. Right. 80,000 SWAT teams. They kill up to 500 dogs a day, the police. Uh, they've executed veterans who have just been in their home when they hear the police coming through the door. They've done nothing wrong. They crashed through the door. Jose Garana in Arizona is a good example, decorated veteran. The police were doing a SWAT team sweep of his neighborhood looking for marijuana, the dangerous plant that now many states are have already legalized. And they crashed through the door in the middle of the night. He grabbed his child, his wife, and put him behind him in the closet. Holly held up his rifle, and then they came. They fired over 70 times and killed him. No something, no pot was found in his home. Mm-hmm. Uh, but they get qualified immunity of the police today in most of those instances. And the Supreme Court now has just ruled last week that the Miranda warnings is basically gave you your Fifth Amendment rights, the right to remain silent, the right to have a lawyer and all these things. 
Yeah. So please don't give that now. That's okay. Yep. They, they can't, you can't, you can't hold anything against them. You can't sue them or anything. What does that say to the police? The Fifth Amendment stinks. I'll smash it. And the Bill of Rights, by the way, we have a Bill of Rights pamphlet. You can go to our website and folds up and goes in your bill fold. Mm-hmm. I'm telling people today, get your families educated. The Bill of Rights is only 462 words. It's not that hard to read either, by the way. It was written by a man who had a good brain called James Madison, who said we ought to mistrust all those in power. And why do you say that? <laughs> all you got to do is read a, a few simple history books to see all the nutty, nutty nuts that get promoted and put in power. And uh, people like Hitler, by the way, I talked about the corporate state. He was put into power by a corporate, a bunch of corporate right. Right. nations that came together. And here's the key. Mm-hmm. Um, Siemens. Uh, Siemens and others. Mm-hmm. Everybody, but the big powers of being. In fact, uh, they held a press conference today uh, that he was going to be appointed. And uh, they said the head of the corporations that came out, they were meeting with this corporation. They said, we, they said, what's your decision? They said, we hired Hitler. That's an actual mm-hmm. quote. Um, and uh, you got to understand this. The love of money is the root of all evil. And we've lost in this country, in my opinion, uh, how we feel about people, how we should treat people. We've lost empathy, care for mm-hmm. others. Uh, I'm surprised when I go to some of the big cities today that have a lot of money, by the way. But you see people laying all over the streets asking for a dime or mm-hmm. a quarter or whatever. They're hungry. They need help. And I'm going, there are 380,000 churches in America. That they could change. You get 20% of those churches active in society with the homeless, teaching the Bill of Rights like the clergy used to do back in the days of the revolution in America, and getting involved in freedom fights and stuff. And you could change the face of the country. But Mm -hmm. getting people up off their butts today and getting them to think, to read, to study is very, very difficult. Uh, we've gone to sleep, basically, in my opinion. The question is, will we wake up? And that is the big question. Can I ask you yeah. a question? You're kind of 40 minutes into where I thought we'd be. <laughs> yeah, he, went, he did a pretty a good job of, there, didn't he? You've traversed <laughs> a lot of territory in a short yeah, time. Yeah, he did. <laughs> uh, uh, I got these, stuff. <laughs> when, when, when you founded the Rutherford Institute, you gave it the name Rutherford. Can you explain to us where that means? And secondly... I understand from a, a broadcast that I saw that you were a Marxist in the 1960s, but now you describe yourself as a civil libertarian. How how does that equate to what we are as biblical Christians? Um, could you just fill in a couple of those? Oh, yeah, my history a little bit. Yeah, I was a, yeah. A, kind of a, a supreme activist uh, when I was in college. I did lean toward Marxism. And then um, I uh, converted to Christianity, and uh, just by providence, if you want to call it that, I ran into some really interesting people. One was Francis Schaeffer, mm-hmm. who was uh, one of the best thinkers I ever talked to, a really good man. Uh, wrote some really good books. I worked with him, became his attorney, and uh, you know, he basically gave me a lot of information uh, and uh, he was a, a really, if you, if you haven't read any of his books, I would. The God Who Was There and stuff are very well done. They're excellent. There's his books right there on my shelf. Yeah. <laughs> he is an amazing thinker, you know, and uh, yep. he's been, you know, bombed a bit by critics and stuff. But right. I was there with him and saw him when he was dying of cancer and all that stuff. But he, he, would, he was willing to stand up and fight for anything. And uh, he introduced me to Samuel Rutherford, by the way, which I didn't know much about. But Samuel Rutherford was a... Uh, Scottish theologian who wrote a book called The Law and the Prince, which basically said either the prince follows the law or toss them out. It was a very strong book, and they burned it in the streets of England. And uh, they, uh, he would have probably been executed, they say, but he died. He was an older fellow on the bed, and they said his last words when he looked up was, today I go to a place where priests and kings cannot go. Yeah. He said, mm-hmm. Bingo, he was dead. <laughs> But uh, it's amazing when I found out that Jefferson and all these guys were ready. Uh, so he had a strong influence, but it was basically 
The prince is under the law, too. We're all under the law. All men are created equal. And uh, this kind of stuff got passed off in the Declaration of Independence. And the Declaration of Independence today is not read in most public school. But if you read it, it's a radical document. Mm -hmm. It said either we have certain inalienable rights. And I, and I ask most Americans, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. What does the word inalienable mean? Can't be taken away. Yeah. Non-transferable, yes. Right. You're hit right on the head. You cannot take your rights away. You're born with them. You can't give them away. You can be stupid. Mm -hmm. You can say do things. You can say, well, I don't have any rights. Against them. But you have them when you get ready to claim them. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that was the whole point of the American government. And uh, so Rutherford had a big impact. And so when I came to name the organization, I said, I was trying to think of something, somebody worthy. And when I thought about it, I said, oh, I, agree. I, I think I agree with him. He has some really strong viewpoints and, uh, you know, talked back to people. And uh, I became a very defiant lawyer during my early days and um, defended, I mean, I, I'll be honest with you, I've defended everybody. Right. I have a friend of mine who is a best-selling author, and he said, John, you need to write a bestseller. And I went, what's that? And he goes, you defend. You should call it I Defend Weirdos. And I went. <laughs> <laughs> I went so, we could, so we could be, we could have you as our lawyer then. Exactly. <laughs> I know. I said, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I've been a lot of weirdos. That's correct. I, when I get that call, at, when I get that call at uh, 2 in the morning, and the guy on the phone, this is like 1979 screaming, I just got arrested. And, and I'm in I'm chain, I'm in jail, and they're they give me one phone call, and I didn't know who you were, but someone said, call Whitehead. He was from Michigan. So he called me. You know, he got arrested for homeschooling. Homeschooling? He got taken away. They came to it. This is when it was illegal. He was a big homeschooler. had five kids in the school, and in his school in his home. And uh, uh, I, I, he didn't have any money, and I, I just got someone. I had someone donate airfare, because that day I didn't have any money at all. I flew mm -hmm. up there argued his case in court and uh, blew the judge's mind because I went through what they actually learned in, in the, their home. It was mm -hmm. amazing. He had all the classics, Mark Twain, all they read everything. I, I brought the books in, stacked in front of the judge's desk, and he looked at the prosecutor and says, why are we here? And pulled me in when we wanted the case. But those are the kind of cases I had in the beginning. And people are going, what are you defending a weird guy that teaches people in the home for? I said, well, I talked to his kids. They were pretty darn smart, smarter than a lot of kids I meet in public school. And uh, so that was uh, the case that opened up the homeschooling movement, basically. It was the first mm -hmm. win they had. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I've been doing that all my life where people come to me and go, oh, and, and other people are going, don't, don't, he's a little strange, you know. And I go, well, that's okay. But even strange people have rights. We all have rights. Mm -hmm. And we all need to be there fighting for each other's rights whether we agree or disagree. And mm -hmm. that's where our society is today. But I was saying, again, the 380,000 churches in this country, if they would come up with and talk like that and work like that, they would be uh, loved institutions. And we make an amazing impact on society, an amazing mm -hmm. impact. Because impact in this country, as the founders knew, starts locally. What's the Tenth Amendment say? Local governments can nullify acts of the federal government. So your local government can say, okay, Mr. Whoever, Mr. Biden, we're not going to do this stuff. Beat it. Yeah, we're going to fight you to the core. Get mm -hmm. your people together. I say start over civil liberties oversight committees and do a lot of things in your community. Help your neighbors. Mm -hmm. Volunteer You know, at the local police department. And people are wondering, like in some cities, police are just shooting people that are running down the street and they're wondering why they shoot them like that. You know, they didn't used to do that. In some cities, this is a scary thing, about 75% of the police work outside, live outside the city, and some of them, 50 to 60%, live in another state and wow. drive into the city. Those are not the police you want. You want local police. And a lot of communities now are starting to require their police to live in the community. And that's a really good thing because you know your neighbors, and it's hard to shoot someone in the back you know or shoot them 18 times and make a joke about it, which some policemen just did uh, in the case. So there's a lot of things I think we can do, but I, we have to start thinking, and we got to get our young people thinking. And uh, I hope by tomorrow, Gabe has read all the uh, 10 Bill of Rights, and we'll start kicking butt. Well, that's the Gary, great thing about question. Oh, uh, 
I was going to just quickly comment here. That's the great thing about homeschooling is that in the public schools, you're right. They don't teach that, right? They don't teach the Bill of Rights. And if you look yeah. back to that, I mean, if you look back to the 1700s and look at um, these great thinkers, the founders, right? That was revolutionary. I mean, the fact that the um, monarch wasn't divine, d- divinely appointed. I mean, that simple yeah. fact alone was just unbelievable and completely revolutionary and we take it for granted nowadays and the fact that that's not taught in public schools not taught in the schools is crazy but i was blessed to be raised by um, parents that did put that as a priority of reading the bill of rights and studying it and know what inalienable rights is they come from god what the the schools don't want and mass media by the way which we can talk about the mass media in a minute uh i've been on all the shows but i i know i've Carl Bernstein, who worked with Bernstein Woodward to uh, get rid of President Nixon. After the Nixon fell, he started working with different news agencies, TV stations, stuff like that. He wrote a detailed article, by the way, which I quote in uh, the book, I think, uh, where he says basically the media works with the government. You know, and I see that now. It's amazing how Facebook just hired two former CIA agents who are now working and coordinating all their material. I'm going, wait a minute here. We need an independent journalist. We need independent mass mm-hmm. media, you know. Right. But and uh, I know I would say this: uh, the mass media used to be what in this country was churches, whatever, whatever religious in synagogues, whoever were teaching, they were doing the mass media. That's all people got. Now, and people right. like Thomas Jefferson, when they saw newspapers emerging and they were owned by very wealthy people, they were going, "This doesn't work." You're not going to get the information you need. Watch out for these for the mass media. Mm-hmm. But most of the people are addicted to it. And the entertainment that we see across mm-hmm. the board, the breads and circuses that so mystified the Roman mm-hmm. people that they couldn't see a monster sitting in their midst. And mm-hmm. that's the problem. You can't see it. The deep state, which Let is Let me there. ask you a question. You say that you're apolit- apolitical, I should say, and that you, you really don't take a stand whether you're a Republican or Democrat. And I really couldn't tell by your books where you were. But the two parties stand for completely different things. One is high taxes, one is pro-socialism, one's pro-regulation, one's pro-abortion, um, one's pro uh, anti-death penalty and the other is pro-physical conservatism pro-lower taxes pro-free market pro-deregulation pro-military so these two are diametrically opposed to one another don't we have to go with one side or the other based on truth and the propensity of truth seems to be towards one versus the other Uh, so how do you work together with people that think completely different than you well, I well, how do I work with them? I work with them. <laughs> I defend them. If they, their constitutional rights are, are yeah. No, I'm not talking whatever. about that. I'm talking I'll about the political arena. I, I'll speak to their groups. By the way, mm-hmm. we what I don't agree with. Uh, but the point is, is that voting for a candidate to me is the least thing you can do. I want to see people active in their government, especially their local governments. And Washington D.C. has never saved this country. I mean. It's always been there for money. It does not save America. I mean, when you look at all the things we're seeing happening around the globe, uh, all the bases around the globe, all the money we're spending, we're dropping a bomb. Sometimes in the Middle Middle East, every 10 minutes, killing women and children, they're involved in those two. Uh, The drone, I've talked to drone operators, by the way, which will freak you out if you've ever done that. These are people who sit in a room somewhere in America and over in Iraq or somewhere, they're tracking someone they have to kill. They send a they just send a missile, bang, they're gone, uh, and they have no conscience when you're talking to them. And that's the thing we have to learn: is does government have a conscience when it's killing people, bombing no. people? No, it's uh, like a video game. It's like a video game. Yeah. We, we ought to mistrust all those in power. Why? Well, Christians ask me you know, when they talk. To me, I said, "Well, you talk. You believe in sin nature? Well, there's some pretty pretty powerful sin nature dudes in government." And they work there, and they want they want what they get. They want the flowers. Nancy Pelosi wants her water every morning, her flowers, and all the things that we provide as tax-paying people. But let's say it again, like I told you. Those underground facilities around the country, those things cost billions of dollars. We didn't vote on any of that. I don't no. vote when they go to war. They just do what they want to do. And here's the thing. The Constitution starts with those three beautiful words, we the people, people do ordain and establish. 
Who's the government? Us. <laughs> Supposedly us. Yeah. And we're supposed to have responsible representatives who are there for us, not there for the 385 Themselves. billionaires that are running the government. And like I said, I've been in out of Washington. I've had them tell me that. I mean, numerous times. It's all about money. Uh, anybody can run for office if they've got the money behind them. And that's what it's all about. You don't see uh, a local guy anywhere without money. He can't run for office. He's got to, you have to bow before the kings. And the kings are who? They're the people didn't with the Didn't money. Donald Trump break that, though? Wasn't yeah, it one of those? Yeah. I don't know. I don't think so. It's continued, hasn't it? But I mean, he wasn't like behind. He might have did, he might have did some interruptions. Yeah. Yes. But yes. Yes. He, he might have did some interruptions, but that's basically it. When you think about, it, and here's the thing: um, when you have the NSA doing two billion emails daily, they read two billion emails daily. They all of our phone calls basically now are recorded. Uh, right. There are over 85 million cameras across the country now in America watching our emotions. I'm telling people, go to Rutherford.org and read our uh, most recent commentary that my wife and I did on this. Mm -hmm. The fact mm -hmm. that everything you're doing is being watched so they can control you. They feed mm -hmm. you what they want you to hear. No the doubt. question is, do you, do you really know it's the truth? Or should you follow the man who wrote the Bill of Rights idea? We ought to mistrust all those in power. Hmm. I don't trust anybody that's in power, to be honest with you. Because, again, like you, you're talking to somebody for over 40 years has been suing them and winning some of the cases and those things. But just seeing how nasty and mean they can be. Right. We had a case where a young Marine was drug out of his home on a Saturday morning about eight years ago because he was posting anti-Obama posts. He didn't like Obama. He thought Obama should be arrested and taken to jail for his uh, executive orders and a number of other things. One morning, Saturday morning, he's at his typewriter working. Uh, he just got through jogging, uh, and uh, he hears the noise outside. He has his home business. He looks outside, and he sees these cars pulling up on his driveway and people in black suits, the men in black, running toward his home. They turn out to be DHS, Department of Homeland Security types, and FBI. And the SWAT team, they told him that they were worried about his post. He didn't own a weapon, by the way. He, his only weapon he had in his home was his parry knife that he could cut his fruit with. <laughs> uh, and they couldn't get a search warrant, see? So he stepped outside, they grabbed him real quick, handcuffed him, slammed him against the fence, tore his back up, decorated veteran, by the way, and took him to a uh, jail cell where he asked for a bandage or could you get me a doctor and put something on my back? They put one of those prison shirts on. He said it's stuck in his back. It hurt so bad. A psychiatrist comes in. This is your government, folk. And did a five-minute, a psychiatrist and said, this guy is crazy because he is a 9-11 truther. He needs right. to be put in behind bars. Like this Dinesh D'Souza. And what happened was uh, they put him in a mental hospital. His mother called me crying. She couldn't get anybody to defend him. They called civil mm -hmm. commitments, which they're just like worship by right. some people. Your neighbor can call you and say, that Gary guy's a little nutty. It's you true. better watch him, boy. I just saw him the other day carrying two guns in the house. And he might have been two umbrella. All of a sudden, you get the police banging in, and they, they call it civil commitments. When we got in this case, he's in a veterans hospital, by the way, uh, this fellow we're helping. $1.5 million annually disappear into mental hospitals in America. Most people don't realize that. Now, think about that, because someone can go, He's crazy. He's that nut that does this and that. And uh, they get away with it. And what was funny was when Brandon called me from the hospital, he said they were trying to force meds on him. And you can't do that in Virginia. And he was in Richmond. And I said, well, we just have to sue the psychiatrist when this thing's over. And finally, we did an appeal in court. The judge looked at all the facts and says, why is this man in the hospital? He shouldn't be there. Mm -hmm. But see, most people can't get the lawyer to help him. And that's where we need to be doing across the country, building a, such a force that we can fight back against this thing that will we'll take us away because they think we're weirdos. And you know what a weirdo is? Our conspiratorialist, someone who says, I don't agree with the government. But it's that's true. That's true. So you're arguing, you're arguing <laughs> that we live in, we're living in a police state 
and that in conjunction with the deep state of the government, which is unelected people and big tech and commerce, they've taken over all of our rights and, and invaded our privacy and removed any way that we can possibly fight back. So the question is, John, how can we? How can we get our rights back? I mean, they can come busting down my door anytime. A couple of us happened to have gone down to Washington on that infamous day. We yes. were there. And, yeah. you know, I, we've been worried whether or not something might happen. And we didn't even go near the building. But you, you never know. And I'm a veteran. I served in Vietnam like yourself. And it, it doesn't mean a thing. What we went to Vietnam to fight against was communism. Now we see it being installed in, 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 oh, yeah. in the capital. Yeah. Like I said, we're moving so what into can a we do? global environment. You know, people don't realize China has a tremendous impact in this country. I don't know if you guys oh, yeah. know this, but they, they uh, uh, oh, yeah. China is buying up farmland. Bill Gates owns 247,000 acres of farmland. I'm going, whoa. He's buying it up. Yep. You're going, what, what in the world are they doing? This was supposed to be a country of local governments, and that's the key. We've lost that. We're all looking toward Washington, D.C. for a savior, and there ain't going to be no savior out of Washington, no. D.C. Uh, there have been some local governments, however, who have really kicked back about all this equipment their local police are getting, grenade launchers, MRAPs, which are these large vehicles with like, tanks on fire. Militarization tires. of the police. Yeah, and they've actually moved that military equipment and gave it back to Washington, D.C., where they were. it was thrown at them. By, by the way, 50% of all that material that went started going about, let's say, 16, 17 years ago, 20 years ago to cops. Uh, 50% of it was purchased by the federal government from large corporations. Would you believe that? Would it be true? Yeah. Well, yes. that's actually true. So it's a big money-making venture, but... Mm -hmm. The problem is, is like when I'm seeing all this stuff happening, you know, how can you fight back? It's how did the founding fathers fight back? How have anybody ever got freedom fought back? You have to get up, move, turn the television set off where you're getting the information from the government and get local, get active, start civil liberties oversight committees. That's what I call them, where you get your friends together and say, here's going to be our first objective. We got to decrease this, whatever you want to decrease, or you think the government's doing wrong, or you have. Uh, for a while there, the Biden administration was actually going to send people out to your doors to check around the is world. That reason, is that really reasonable though? Because I, I watch this: is the government shut us in our houses, closed our churches, and muzzled our faces with masks, and people didn't fight back. They didn't do anything. No, they usually they don't fight back. Like sheep. It's always Exactly, you're hitting it. That's why, why <laughs> when I look at history and say, why did they burn her? Why did they nail him to a cross? Why did they shoot him? You know, uh, your your Dietrich Bonhoeffer, you know, who went to the yeah. chambers, got killed because Hitler killed him because he opposed him. A pastor said the uh, the way you know the way of the uh, uh, Christian is uh, the cross. Mm -hmm. You're going to get your head smacked. The question mm -hmm. is, are you going to sit back and watch everybody else get smacked? Or are you going to step out and say things that people don't like? And I have a lot of people who say, I mean, I get attacked on, you know, here and there by people who say, you, you know, you don't agree with this, don't agree with that. Uh, you, what you're saying is nutty, you know that. But what I'm saying is, well, maybe I made you think a little bit. We need to start making people think. One person in the city council meeting is considered a weirdo. Three people with the same sign, though, chanting, four, five, six. They start listening. We you saw that in Loudoun it. County. In Loudoun yeah. County, we saw that. Yeah. What happened the in Loudoun County? The parents standing up at the board meetings, school board meetings against CRT. Yeah. And then you got Yunkin, which I don't know whether he's good or bad, but oh, at yeah. least he was... At least he stood up against the powers that be that want to control uh, everything their children are learning. Yeah, exactly. And I think that's good. So there are, you know, again, if it's democratic, it means, but you see, again, we the people, uh, yeah. you, you've got to be involved. If you're just watching and going, oh, geez, what is uh, CNN reporting today? Hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't watch any of the mainstream media. 
I do my own research, come to my own conclusions. Mm-hmm. And but I actually had some top media people talk to me. <laughs> Uh, when I was in the Paula Jones case, if you remember that, I sued Bill Clinton. Right. Uh, and uh, he sold out of court for over a million dollars. So we had 10 women lined up. He said, that's it, I quit. Bango, he ran away. But uh, uh, I had a number of people who met with me, man, and just said, it's, you know, there's not a lot of hope, you know, with the way this, this thing operates. And uh, it's only going to be someone standing up and fighting back but you know again i've had my head smacked i feel like i tell you what i feel like sometimes i'm walked down to the edge of a cliff and i see somebody way down there i'm going hey (laughs) i see something coming can you hear me you know your voice uh, crying in the wilderness but you got to be able to defend everybody no matter your beliefs is what i'm saying uh i've defended every religion um Jews, Muslims, defended their rights, you know, because the First Amendment doesn't say uh, that religion is just for Christians. It's for everybody. And you, uh, sometimes, um, sometimes it's tough, by the way. I defended a Jewish congregation up in New Jersey. The police actually, they were watching them. For whatever reason, they put a surveillance camera up on there right across from the street to watch them. And I was going, right. what? And they, call, they called me and said, do you know, can you hear anybody you can suggest with help? And I said, uh, I can help. They said, but you're a Christian. We, we probably wouldn't hire a Christian. And I said, well, why don't you look up my history, ma'am, and see what you think. They had to have a special meeting. They called me later and said, okay, you're the guy. <laughs> so we threatened to sue the cops. We backed them down, and they uh, put the camera down. But we got to work together. And Martin Luther King maybe said it best. And he was a bright guy, by the way. He had his problems, but he was a bright guy. He said, we may have arrived here all in different boats, but we're in the same boat now. And if there's going to be, if you work, if you love your kids, your grandchildren, you're going to do something about it. You can listen to this program. Okay, this program maybe should open some doors. Read the books, Battlefield America. Go to our website, Rutherford.org. Get educated and uh, stand up. Because listen, if it hadn't been for people who put their lives on the line, most of the people who signed the Declaration of Independence, a lot of them were shot and killed, executed. Right. But they put their lives on the lines for freedom. And you know something that really counts eternally? It also yeah. means one thing. There's hope because there are people who care about people. You have to care about people. If people are down and hurt, let's help them, folks. I'm bogarting my way in here. but uh, um, Hey, you've been talking enough. Okay. I, all right. Go ahead, Gary. <laughs> Scott and I have known each other for 40 years. We fight like cats and dogs once in a while. But it's good. It's good. All right. Um, I got a lot of stuff, but let me go here. I think one of the things that we have not brought up is why people are willing to put up with this kind of police state that you've described. And the issue is safety. They want safety. Ever since 9-11, ever since the Patriot Act, yes. they've wanted to, to um, let go of liberty for the sake of safety. And if I remember correctly, uh, Tom, no, not Thomas, Ben Franklin said he who would give up his liberty for a little bit, little safety is not worthy of either. Right. So I think that's the that. issue. That's the issue here is the issue of safety. How it would seem to me that it's what, fear driven. Yes, it definitely is fear driven. And we have documents that are supposed to help us with that. We've got, as you said, the Declaration of Independence. We've got the Constitution, which, by the way, this current president has said is not absolute. <laughs> um, yeah, and so uh, they're taking those away, and it's like uh, it's no longer we the people, it's we the government. We're endowed by our government with these rights, and that means we can take them away, on and on. Um, how important is that idea of safety, and how about we just get out of our safety zone and do what needs to be done to get our freedoms back? Well, Hitler said it best. He said that fear was the way you control people. And uh, it moves them into that final phase of society. I mentioned disassociation. People start getting, oh, uh, watch out for that creep. I don't be, don't get near him because you'll get, you'll get in trouble if the government sees you with him. Uh, that's exactly how Hitler handled it and his, his so-called uh, government boys helped him uh, push it through. And... Uh, I've done a detailed study of Hitler's actions 
And there are some good books out there, by the way, that really nail all this down. But, yeah, the people moved into that phase where they said, basically, I'm, I'll feel safer in my home. Well, I'll report the guy next door. And people are doing it in this country, by the way. Civil commitment. Yes. And some red flag gun laws. Yeah, exactly. Okay, those kind of things are really dangerous. And people are starting to do that. Uh, people would get arrested for listening to BBC radio during Hitler's term. If, they, if, they, if a neighbor heard an right. English radio on, they would contact the Nazis and they would come and get him and they would drag people away. And so that's basically uh, the people, the human race, I, I would, let me go back to a little deeper. <laughs> let me ask you a question. Though, first. Our, our DNA, uh, basically, sometimes gets twisted. And there are just people who are not going to do anything basically out there. You can preach to them. And you should preach right. them. Yep. And you should talk to them. They're not going to move. But there's that small minority of troublemakers. And that's why uh, familial research and DNA, are you familiar with that? Yes. The FBI is doing it. They're going back into your history to see if, right. if you had rebels. Exactly. Right. Mm -hmm. if you were related to, what's his name, that Jefferson guy, whatever. Yep. He's mocked by everybody now in many places, which I find absurd. I thought and he had black relatives. Huh? <laughs> I thought he had black relatives. That's what they're saying. Uh -huh. <laughs> the point is, um, you know, it's it's part of our, we, we've, we've gone through this phase, Rome, Greece. All, I look at all these cultures and I'm going, it's been done over and over and over and over. The only thing that saved the British Empire, by the way, and it's been documented, they pulled back from the war machine and came home. And uh, America the Empire. Up the war machine. It's draining our economy. Over thirty trillion dollars in debt, this country thirty trillion dollars, and we're still giving billions of dollars to other countries left and right through the Biden administration. And I'm going, I didn't vote for any of that stuff, man. No. I don't get to vote for any of the stuff you're doing in Congress. That's why local governments need to be governing this stuff and saying, no, 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 you can't have our money. We're going to hold it here, and we're going to open a homeless shelter. We're going to do this. We're going to open a civil liberties shelter. We're going to protect our rights against you. And Can I go back to a thought you had 10 minutes ago? Yeah. Um, about where we're at. Do you, you know Naomi Wolf? I think you quote yeah. her in one of your yeah. books. She's recently written a, a book and an article on the 10 steps towards fascism. Yeah. Have you read that at all? I have not she read says it we're at the. She says we're at the 10th step now. Oh, yeah. We're in fascism. We're already and in that the, next, the, the last of the 10 steps is a complete, um, what do you call a military lockdown. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you believe we're that close to the end of all freedom? I think so. I think most people have shut down mentally. I think with the uh, way the mass media bombards their brains, uh, they're having trouble thinking. Uh, they don't know who's telling the truth. Uh, <clears throat> I mean, they believe the TV is telling the truth. And listen, uh, I just I say that's not happening. So I think, yeah, I think uh, Battlefield America and the Government of the Wolves books, I go into that. Yeah, we're, we've, uh, mm -hmm. and again, I'm, I'm not a conspiracy theorist here, but uh, Project Paperclip, you've heard of that, I'm sure, uh, when they brought the Nazis into this country after World War II. Yes. Mm -hmm. 1,600 Nazis were brought in. Right. Reinhold Gayhard, Gaylord, I'm sorry. He was Hitler's, one of Hitler's top chief uh, surveillance guys. He helped set up the CIA. They went into education systems, governments, Helps set up NASA and some things like that. Right. Now, right. do you think that would have influenced the government any? I do a little bit here because I've studied the McCarthy era when the FBI was going into people's doors and checking on them because they criticized the government or they said this or said that. Frank Sinatra, Ernest Hemingway, you go down the list, all these people just because they were disagreeing. That started a long time ago. And now with all the statistics I have in my books and stuff we write about, <clears throat> we live in a excuse me, total surveillance state. Now, the Fourth Amendment says, you're not supposed to be looking at me, Mr. Government, or Mrs. Government, or whatever your name is, unless you have evidence, some evidence I'm doing something wrong. Why are you, why are you collecting all my phone calls? Why are you taking all my emails? Why are you watching me where you're going? Now they have the AI that reads on my emotion on my face. I'm walking down the street. What are they doing that for? On cameras in big cities. Uh, I had a, some people who went to communist China about 10 years ago, and they said it was freaky. These are Americans. They said we were sitting in a restaurant, and all of a sudden, they'd watch police cars pull up real quick and grab somebody off the street, 
drag them into a car screaming and drive off. People just kept walking. And that like mm -hmm. they didn't see it. Okay? Mm -hmm. Do I think that could come to America? Or is it moving close? Listen, the bystander effect, I don't know if you've read about that. It's, I've talked about it in the books. People will watch people get kicked around by a policeman or whatever. And just kind of go do nothing. Why don't we rush him and get him off? Get off that. He's an American citizen. You know, treat him right. You know, because we have the same thing. Again, part of it's fear. But fear, fear. is the, fear yeah. is what leads to fascism. And do I think we're in a fascist state? Sorry, guys. I do. I believe that we are in a fascist state already. We're there. We've been there for a while. Gabe, Gabe, you have a question? Yeah. Uh, going back to the Patriot Act. Um, was there anything redeemable in the act? Like, is there, was it good in any way or was it, should it just com completely be scrapped? What's your opinion on that? I agree with, uh, Ron Paul when he came out against it. And, uh, in fact, I talked to him on the phone, <laughs> uh, and, and no, I mean, when they were allowing the government agents to come into your banks and get all your information and the banks can't tell you going to the library government, watching everything you're doing. Because supposedly someone crashed into the towers in New York, uh, which, of course, that's been greatly disputed by a number of people who did that. But, again, it goes back to that principle. No, I don't, I don't think there's anything really. No, there's the only thing that's really salvable in this country are the Bill of Rights and how people exercise those rights. Are you going to sit back and just get slapped in the head? Or are you going to take a stand? Maybe get arrested for going on the street corner. We defend a lot of people who do that, by the way. And I like them when they get out there and say, you know, the street corner and start going down with the government or whatever. Uh, and that might make a few people think. And that's the hardest thing to get people to do again, like I keep saying, get people to think. But so how, how, no, how would I, you get somebody? There's really redeemable about what came out. 9-11 was the beginning of the great slide that we're seeing. COVID was part of it, I believe. And all these things we've seen when people were locking in their homes and hiding and all that stuff. There's some validity, of course, with the COVID thing, but the effects and the way they were dealing with it, you know, all of a sudden, bang, 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 and are we get people getting arrested and stuff. I mean, I don't know. Who is the who is the government again? We the people. It ain't the people locking us, up, making us lock down. Yep. So how would... How what would, are the watershed events... No, that I, led to yeah, where we're at now. Besides, like the Patriot Act, are there other ones that we should look back to and say these events have have been the dominoes that have fallen that have caused the problems that we're suffering with now? Well, I'd say the big slide started at nine eleven, obviously with the Patriot Act, and then all we saw after that. I mean, the Department of Homeland Security, which most people don't realize, does threat assessments on homes across America. They go from uh, green to red, depending on whether you own a firearm. You've been arrested or whatever. They're watching everything we're doing. And uh, FBI agents now showing up at school board meetings. Uh, parents are an extremist if they get up and speak at a school board meeting. And that's another thing. Go to your school board meetings. If they're not teaching the Declaration of, and Bill of Rights in your school, they're, they're <clears throat> they should be kicked right in the butt really hard mentally. And so there's, you know, it's... Scary. The FBI is watching everything you do. They work with local police. They have uh, apps now the police have where they can set up uh, basically fake accounts, social media accounts, lure you in to say something stupid. Then they come to your door. You can get a, you know, a, a knock and talk at night or whatever, and people being shot in those and stuff like that. All the things that we're seeing across the country. So you know, I think the government is very corrupt. I think the government is extremely corrupt. So do you think January 6th was a red flag? Was it real? Was it an insurrection? Or was it a government uh, setup? I think, to be honest with you, and I, got, I have to, as I've studied these things, um, the FBI and different groups way back, again, the FBI, again, motivated by probably philosophy that came from another country in many ways. Uh, during the 60s, when the hippies were in their little groups, their communes, smoking their pot, right. the FBI would grow their hair long beard, smoke pot with them, watch everything they're doing, and then report them and watch them. I mean, they were watching everything, you know. Again, they've, they've been very good at infiltrating things. That's why when I tell people, start a Civil Liberties Oversight Committee, but really be careful when someone comes in your group that looks just a, too, a bit too chummy and weird. I've had them do that, by the way, with me. Try to be friends with me. People come in, 
beat with me and they're here or there and I'm going, wait, when they walk out, I'm saying, that wasn't quite right. That didn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. And it won't make sense. So you can be easily infiltrated if you're not alert. And I believe that that there was definitely some infiltration there. And they want to see, here's the thing. They love violence. If you commit violence, they can swim their SWAT team out, their armed guards, and blast you away. But just think, you know, again, you guys are older enough, you're, with me, you've seen it. Things progress over time. When I was a kid growing up, the local police wore brown outfits. My next door neighbor was the local police chief in Bartonville, Illinois. When I grew up. I asked him one day why he didn't carry a gun, and he didn't. He said, "I don't want to shoot anybody." John he got in the car and drove off. Barney, uh, there you go. That was the philosophy. In the 1980s, there were 3,000 SWAT team raids occurring annually. Now over 80,000. Why are they yeah. doing it for stuff like pot? And crazy things, people getting shot. And I've had, I had a police chief actually contact me and says, no more SWAT team raids in my small town. He said that the police crashed through a door and one of his policemen put a uh, rifle to a four-year-old kid's head. He said, we've gone too far. And I've had a policemen, by the way, good cops come and talk to me. There are a lot of good people concerned about the militarized training of police. Right. That moves us into the fascist state we're talking about. Just like Nazi Germany. They come get you when they want to. They have qualified immunity when they shoot you or kill you, and they don't. Nothing happens to them. Isn't that what Oath Keepers was about? They were supposed to maintain their oath to the Constitution and not do things like what you're talking about right now because it violated the rights of people. That's where that whole thing came from. Yeah, is my so. understanding. I hear. I don't know yeah, much I, about I, them. It's probably gone to the the far end. I, I'm taking up too much time. Gary, you got a question? Well, yeah. Let me go on. Um, we talked about. The issue of rewriting, we haven't talked yet about the issue of rewriting history, rewriting American history. Uh, apparently, now if you go into Jefferson's house, it's been redone to show how he was a terrible uh, slave owner, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, to try to rewrite that instead of the statesman that he truly was writing uh, the Declaration Amen. of Independence and uh, oh, yeah. a number of other documents. So there's this whole kind of, the 1619 Project, the CRT, all this stuff. They are trying to rewrite history uh, so that it looks like we're, we're awful. I've talked about, and any of my people from my church listening, you know I've talked about replacing the four C's with the big C. Constitution, Christianity, capitalism, and um, what's the last C? <laughs> I know I gotta get it. Out. He's old. I'm getting old. <laughs> and Christianity. Okay, Christianity. there we are. Yeah, there we are. are. <laughs> All right. So in replacing it with the big C, communism. Um, and so this whole aspect of rewriting history seems to be huge in making this change in our culture. Maybe you could speak to that a little bit. It's scary. I mean, rewriting history. Yeah, I've seen it because. Again, writing 30 books, I'm just a researcher. Uh, some people say I'm a nerd. And I research and do my projects. And I, when I see some of these people, how they're twisting what they said or what they thought or what they did and giving their theories, I know what they're doing. Yeah, it's PC. Uh, it's the whole idea of getting hate towards somebody that did some good things. And when I run into these people sometimes and actually debate them, I'm always going, well, are you perfect? And they'll kind of, well, you know, I'm so... If you think you're perfect, go look in the mirror. You'll change your mind. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the people who, listen, it was a culture. It came through. They did some bad things, obviously. But they handed us a document that's dynamite for freedom, the Declaration of Independence. It says if you don't want the government, folks, throw the butts out and create a new government. The kid, they don't want kids doing it. They don't want rebels. And I'm saying we need more rebels out there, by the way. And what a good rebel is, someone who sacrifices nonviolently, who gets out there, who will stand up for the truth, get kicked in the head occasionally, get criticized, and uh, stand up for the truth. The more people we do that, we can change the face of this country. And I think it can start in churches, by the way. If we can get churches involved and educated and reading books like Battlefield America and learning, hey, we're in a bad system. If we're going to do anything good, we're going to have to... Uh, get out there on the front lines. It isn't sitting. No, it's standing. It's walking. Well, the, and it's challenging government officials. 
Didn't the apostles do that? They practiced yeah. civil disobedience when they were told not to preach the gospel any longer. Right, and Paul, the truth Paul, about Paul, Jesus Paul, Christ. Or whatever. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and they they told the Sanhedrin, hey, you've gone a line too far. We can't cross that. Yeah. Do whatever you want to us, but we're going to remain faithful to the and Lord. I keep saying, if you're going to do it, get ready to get your you know, Dietrich Bonhoeffer's right. The way of the cross, you know, mm -hmm. uh, is the, you know, the Christian action. And, you know, Jesus was arrested in the middle of the night by some guy who did a phony kiss on him. And a SWAT team grabbed him and took him away, basically. Uh, That's basically right. It's what's happened today. It's happening today. So we're repeating history. And there's only one hope, I say. Yeah. And again, you're right about the historical figures I read about. I mean, they weren't perfect. Uh, I'm not perfect. Nobody on the show is perfect. We can criticize anybody. But what they handed us was like, whoa, mm -hmm. good stuff. And it inalienable rights. We're all equal before the law. All people are equal. Okay, if I'm equal, then uh, Caesar Biden is not any better than I am. No, I'm just as important as he is. Yeah. Um, there is the concept that we see that now we have a two-tier justice system. So that you just said that we're all equal, but it appears to be more and more that there is a justice system for the elite and a justice system for the rest of it. And they are currently exercising that to the fullest and the greatest extent that they can. Uh, maybe that would be worth talking about for just a little bit. Oh, yeah, it's there. I mean, it's um, why I started the Rutherford Institute is I saw that early on. I saw people needing lawyers and they couldn't afford the $5,000 retainer fee. Or the, I said, well, I'll start a group that will actually fund these cases, which we've done hundreds now. But that's it. Yeah, it is for the elite. That's why, you know, again, getting out there and helping people is the way to do it and what, what we've done from the beginning. But like I said, the oligarchic elite run Washington, D.C. There was another study that came out of SMU, by the way, which I didn't notice, which is a little scary, uh, in 2018. They did a study where psychopathology focused in America, and the professors came to the conclusion it was Washington, D.C. And psychopaths can be cool, people love them, they do all this stuff, but they have one thing that's in mind, true. promoting themselves. And that's what basically, you know, again, the ego gets, thing. and that's one good thing about Christianity. Christianity squashes the ego. It says, put it down, get out there, do unto others you'd have them do unto you. Don't just do you, do others. And that's it. Be other directed. And if we were, could teach our kids that, could teach our society, don't be sitting around worrying about what's going to help me, help what's going to help the guy who needs help. And there are a lot of people in this country that need help, by the way. A lot of folks. Yeah, you know, I agree that churches should be involved in that. You mentioned it earlier. I have done that. Uh, I have uh, been criticized highly that I'm too political as a pastor. <laughs> And, uh, and I actually have lost people to the church because they said, uh, you're too political. And my view is I'm just allowing my faith to infiltrate uh, my, uh, my political pers pers perspectives and viewpoints. Uh, and that's what I tell people every election cycle. I tell them to go out and vote their uh, Christian faith. Yeah. The point is, is too, again, I go back to early America. The clergy in early America is the reason we have the freedoms we have today. They're That's the true. ones, when the British entered a lot of towns, the first thing they did, they burned the churches. And the people said, why? Because that's where the patriots met. And you had the black, black regiment, which, which actually give her their sermons, and then pull their, put their rifle out and put it against the, the podium, which... If you that today yeah. everybody run out of the church and say he's crazy. Yeah. These <laughs> but, were clergy statesmen. That's yeah, who they were. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Witherspoon, people like that. Yeah. Who, by the way, uh, Witherspoon, I didn't know it until I studied, greatly affected uh, James Madison and a lot of things he thought. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. um, folks, it's all out there. Uh, you can do it. You just have to get up and do it. You know, uh, don't come to me crying about freedom if you're not willing to get out there and take a stand for it. That's what I say. I've been doing it for over 40 years now, and um, it's difficult. The way the government, the way the global society, the way uh, the, all this uh, AI is starting to enter the picture, it's going to be pr pretty, pretty tough stuff. Gabe? Yeah. 
I mean, you haven't said anything. You want to? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No worries. You, I mean, you've already been talking about some great stuff. Also, halfway through, the power went out uh, in the dorm room. Yes. So <laughs> there was also that. But uh, no, I mean, amazing, amazing conversation. Um, I appreciate you coming on. Um, hundred percent agree, Thank right? You. We're in un- a lot of unknown territory, right? With t- technology, with tracking. I mean, I can go on my phone right now oh, and yeah. see the last everywhere I've been for the past four months, six months, year, like just a yeah. map of exactly where I went, how long I was there. The government knows that the, the, government, knows the, it too. the government knows that. And it's scary, but also we, uh, we can trust that the Lord knows all. And I think we're getting close to the day when the Lord will return. So we can always look forward to that. The Lord should never stop fighting. Say, I ain't going to take this anymore. Speak truth to power like Jesus did. Yep, exactly. But I appreciate it, and I appreciate you standing up where a lot of people aren't willing to do that. Do you have any new books coming out? Uh, Not right now, no. Uh, Working on it. Yeah, I'm working on a couple, but like I say, uh, I do a lot of research to make sure that what I put on paper is accurate. Where can people um, see your work, uh, hear you? Read things. Uh, can you give us a little bit of that information? Yeah, so go to Rutherford, Rutherford.org, Rutherford.org. We have weekly commentaries, press releases. Uh, we have sections on the Constitution. Uh, you can, like I say, you can get to the Bill of Rights pamphlet. Just go there, get the stuff, get educated. Education precedes action, and it's time to kick butt for freedom. <laughs> well, we are, uh, certainly appreciate you being with us. Uh, I have... I had 35 questions. I think we covered like maybe yeah, eight. Yeah, I know, I know, but, uh, I know. By the way, your but, research, uh, I'm just looking at Government of Wolves. You got 669 references. I'd say that's a <laughs> lot of research. That's a lot of research. <laughs> so we want to thank you for uh, joining us, and I will get in touch with you in the future. Thank maybe you, we sir. can have another one of these sessions. And we just want to pray for you and that God will continue to use you in this good work. So let us pray. Father, we thank you for John and his uh, mission through the Rutherford Institute. We pray, Lord, that you would use him to accomplish righteousness. Help us, Lord, to be part of the solution in our nation and not part of the problem. We know that a nation that exalts righteousness honors you, and the one that does not brings dishonor. So help us, Lord, to uh, just bring honor and glory to you as we await the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray this in his name. Amen. 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 Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank you. (laughs) Have a great day. Thank you for listening to another episode of the book podcast if you liked what you heard and want to support us like follow subscribe on any podcasting platform on youtube on facebook instagram or twitter simply type in at hear the book pod at hear the book pod thank you see you next time